Good morning on this Easter Sunday and welcome to our service. A couple of announcements before we begin. First of all, Morris's midweek message returns on Wednesday evening. And then our WhatsApp prayer group is up and running. If you have any prayer requests, please send them to me and we'll pray together. On this Easter Sunday morning, we turn our attention to that first Easter as we begin our service. Mary Magdalene, another Mary and Salome arrive at the tomb, worried about how they're going to get in, but discover that the stone is rolled away. As they enter the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they led him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you.
little girls and boys and happy Easter. It is a different sort of Easter because we're all at home but I hope that you are enjoying your time off and that you're doing things that you really love to do. I know during my time off um, I'm missing school, I'm missing being with my class but I am also enjoying having a little, having a little more time to bake and to cook and I've been baking buns and cakes and loaves and different things that we can enjoy eating at home and it's lovely to have the time to do that. So today is Easter Sunday and I thought it might be nice to bake an Easter cake because I've got something to celebrate. Now for my Easter cake I need two eggs and I have my eggs here with me. Now you all know what eggs are like and I'm sure you have some eggs in your house. There's a hard shell and then inside we have our egg white and our egg yolk. And this is a really important ingredient sometimes when we're cooking. So here's my bowl. I'm going to crack open the egg and I'm sure you'll know what it's like inside. There we go. And that's one egg. All cracked. Brilliant. And then I need my other egg. So here we go. Oh! Oh no! That's not what I expected. Boys and girls, the, the egg's empty. There should be egg yolk and egg white in here, but it's absolutely empty. Do you know, that actually reminds me of a story from the Bible. It's a story about the tomb. It's a story about some ladies who went to the tomb on Easter morning. When they arrived, just like my egg, the tomb was empty. They were shocked. They were surprised. Jesus wasn't there. So I'm going to go and sit down somewhere more comfortable and I'm going to read you that story. The story I have for you is called A Very Happy Easter. Now this book is a little bit different to other books. You will see faces of people who were at the first Easter when Jesus died and rose again. Every time you see one, try and copy the face they are making and think about how they would have felt. Let's try it. Are you ready? Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem. A huge, excited crowd welcomed Jesus. They knew he was God's promised king. But some people did not want Jesus to be in charge. So they sent soldiers to arrest him. They hated Jesus because he was the son of God. They put King Jesus on a cross to die. Jesus' friends were very scared. Jesus died. His friends cried. They buried Jesus in a rock tomb and put a big heavy stone over the door. Jesus' friends were so sad. On the third day, early in the morning, some women came to the tomb, but the stone was rolled away. Jesus was not there. They were so confused. Some angels appeared, they said, he is not here, he is risen, just as God had promised. The women were astonished. The women ran and told Jesus' friends what they had seen and what the angels had said. He is risen, but they did not believe them. Suddenly, Jesus was right there with them. He spoke to them. He ate with them. He showed them his hands and feet. He really was alive again. Jesus' friends were startled, afraid, amazed, confused. Don't be afraid, said Jesus. It really is me. I died and I am now alive again. You can be friends with God forever. Jesus' friends were happy, happier, the happiest they'd ever been in their whole lives. Then King Jesus sent his friends to tell everyone the good news. They happily spread the message all over the world. 
And now you have heard the message about how King Jesus died and rose again so that we can be friends with God forever. What face will you make now? I really hope on Easter Sunday that we can have a big smile on our face because the tomb was empty. Jesus was not there. He had risen again and that was something really to smile about and it is something that we can smile about now. God is powerful. Even when we worry about things, we need to always remember that God is in control and he is powerful. And that is a reason for us to smile today. Let's pray. Jesus, you have overcome death and conquered every fear we could imagine. Help us to live each day remembering that you are alive, that you are bigger than anything or any situation and that your power is real. Jesus, you're our hero and we are walking with you. Amen. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, Easter Sunday is a time when we celebrate the joy of the resurrection, the hope that is ours of life eternal through Jesus Christ, who conquered death, who gained the victory over the grave, Yet we come to you this Easter Sunday and many people are filled with great fear and uncertainty. This is a time of illness and for some death. A time of isolation and not togetherness. A time of loneliness and not fellowship. A time of fear and no hope for some. We in your church hold fast to the truth that you are in control of everything. Yet we live in a world that is so different than even from a couple of months ago. There are people mourning today the death of a loved one. And they mourn without the usual way of doing so, meeting together, sharing stories. It's cold and difficult. And so we pray that you would bring comfort to those who mourn. We pray for those who are ill and who have ended up in hospital like our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. We thank you that he is recovering and we pray for those like him who have been in intensive care, that they may come through it and get stronger and healthy once more. Again, we pray for all who work within our hospital system, for the medical staff, for the cleaning staff, for those who work in the labs and do a million and one other necessary jobs. We pray for all who work in nursing homes and who put their own lives at risk to look after those who are elderly and frail. We pray for our emergency services and all those essential workers who allow us to continue warm in our homes, even though we are isolated. We pray for those who are working tirelessly to come up with a vaccine to counter this virus. We ask that their efforts may soon be rewarded. 
Father, we thank you for the many acts of kindness that we have heard of, where neighbours have been looking after those isolated older folks within their communities. We thank you that in these days we see the very best of human nature and alas, sometimes the very worst. Father, we are at home. We cannot meet with others. Our streets are deserted. Our shops and places of entertainment are closed. Our work life is disrupted. Our children's schooling is disrupted. And we can hardly believe that such things can happen. We would not have believed it possible two or three months ago. Father, forgive us when we take for granted the things that we regard as normal and our rights. We pray that you would remind us of the frailty of life and the uncertainty of life. And yet to know that in you, the rock of our salvation, the one who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Your love endures forever and you never change. Your word never changes, your love never changes, your peace never changes. The truth of this Easter season never changes also. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over death, victory over fear. Hope rules within our hearts because of him. And it is in the words that Jesus taught us, we conclude our prayers today. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning and happy Easter to you all. Morris has asked me this morning to share with you the impact that social distancing and social isolation has been having on my family life. For those of you who don't know me too well, I live with my husband, our two daughters who are in nursery and primary school age, and our dog. My husband and I both work full time and in many ways we are your typical family you know our weeks are full of activities and clubs for the girls attending birthday parties evening meetings socializing leading groups church and all those normal everyday activities that mean we're very rarely all in the house together for a prolonged period of time that has obviously changed rather dramatically over the last three to four weeks and it's taken some getting used to we're in the fortunate position where I'm now able to work from home full time and be here for the kids as my husband is an essential worker and still going to his work. My work have been very understanding and flexible regarding the fact that I'm trying to work whilst educating and entertaining two relatively young children. However, as I'm sure many of you have also experienced, I've had moments where things have been overwhelming. The responsibility of trying to balance these different commitments has been challenging. I felt that I'm not doing a good enough job for either my employer or for my children regularly, especially when I look on social media and viewed other people seemingly balancing everything perfectly. Trying to find that balance has been a challenge, especially whilst trying to make sense of what's currently happening in the world around us and how best to communicate that to my kids. But I'm reminded on a daily basis how incredibly blessed my family is. Whilst a drastic change in our daily lives can feel like a lot has been taken away from us, I can't help but reflect and appreciate how much we've gained from this time together. 
we've gained time. In our normal daily rush lives, I miss out on a lot of homeworks, dinners and bedtimes together because of other commitments. But in the last three weeks, I've been here for them all. We've sat together and eaten dinner as a family whilst having conversations. We've danced together, read stories, painted rainbows and prayed. I've been able to do different activities with both my girls when they've asked, instead of always saying, in a minute, but never seeming to find the time. It's highlighted to me how much I've missed out on, and it's made us reassess as a family where our priorities lie. It's made me re-look re at what is normal for our family and consider what parts of our old normal we want to keep or rush back to. As a family, we've been talking about what we're looking forward to doing when this passes. And these things haven't been physical things like shopping or toys. It's been time together with friends and family in nature. We started writing down things that we missed and we can't wait to do when all this passes and putting them in an empty jar. But the number one thing that my girls want when this is over is for the four of us to take the dog to go to the beach and then visit Granny and Grandad. It's simple for them. They already have the important things that they want and need around them. To make it perfect, they just need the seaside and additional family members. I pray that this simplicity of needs and the ability to filter out the excess and noises and distractions in daily life stays with us after social distancing ends. And I know that going forward, I will continue to try and seek out those quiet moments to listen and to learn. Thank you.
The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 11. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Amen. The title for our sermon this morning is Three Men Forgiven. One was a friend, one was family, a brother, and one was a foe, Paul himself. And these three men are mentioned specifically in this passage of Scripture because all three discovered the risen Saviour and Lord had the power to forgive and to put them back on their feet again. So I'd like to explore that with you a little bit this morning. The context is the church in Corinth where there are starting to become divisions and debates about who Jesus really is and uh, what he's about. And Paul in this passage is reminding them that Jesus, first of all, died to take away their sin, was buried and then rose again, triumphant over sin. And he tells them that there are lots of people still alive who are witnesses to that. The first one he mentioned was one of Jesus' closest friends, Peter. At the beginning of our service, we read that passage from Mark in which the three ladies were told by the angel to go back to the disciples and to Peter and tell them that Jesus would go ahead of them and meet them in Galilee. Now, why was Peter mentioned specifically by name? Was it because he was their leader? Possibly. Was it because of the things that Peter had done on that night Jesus was arrested that caused him himself to doubt whether he was a disciple of Jesus or not? But anyway, Peter is mentioned. And we know of how Jesus met with Peter by the Sea of Galilee and made breakfast and he talked to Peter and he asked Peter, did he love him? And as Peter had denied Jesus three times, so he was asked the same question three times and it was as if as each answer was given, Peter was cleansed more and more until Jesus was sure that this Peter that was sitting with him by the Sea of Galilee was a different Peter than the one who denied him on that fateful night in Gethsemane by the high priest's palace. 
Peter, the friend who had wronged Jesus. But now through Jesus' resurrection, the gift that he gave to Peter was one of love and grace and forgiveness. I know lots of people who decided to follow Jesus as children and as teenagers. But then as they grew up, they lost their fervour, the things of the world, the worries of work and family just took away that desire and that passion to serve Jesus. And some in a very quiet way, just drifting along, just drifted further and further and further away from Jesus. Denied him in every aspect of their lives. The wonderful message of today is that you could have done nothing worse than what Peter did. And Peter was forgiven. And so can you be. The second person mentioned by name is James. And this James is Peter's brother. The son of Mary and Joseph. And James, like the rest of his family, when Jesus started his ministry, didn't believe a word that he said. They couldn't understand why this brother was now doing and saying all these things that brought him into conflict with the synagogue leaders. Maybe they were frightened that he was going to be put to death. Maybe they thought he'd gone mad. But clearly for a long, long time through Jesus' three years of ministry, they didn't support him at all and James certainly didn't. They were opposed to him. Family members who thought he's lost his head. He can't be Messiah. He's our brother. He's my son. He's my uncle, whatever. But something did change that final week of Jesus' life. The awful things that he endured at the hands of the Roman soldiers. The cruelty of the cross must have had such an impact on James's life that there was a change in his thought and his understanding. There is an ancient tradition the James, realising how wrong he was, had said that he would never eat again until he could eat with Jesus. And the tradition goes like with Peter, Jesus brought food and had a meal with his brother after his resurrection. And from that moment on, James was a different James. He became leader of the church in Jerusalem, one of the bulwarks of the faith in that hostile city. So there was the friend who had wronged Jesus, the brother who had thought he was mad. And now there was the foe, the enemy. Saul of Tarsus, steeped in the scriptures, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one of the leading lights and rising stars of the Jewish hierarchy. And he utterly was convinced that Jesus was wrong. Totally, completely and utterly 
opposed to everything that Jesus was about. He could not be Messiah. He was hung upon a tree. He could not be Messiah. He came from Nazareth. He could not be Messiah because he didn't come with power and with majesty and with might. He just couldn't be. And all these followers of Jesus who were saying insane things that Jesus was raised from the dead and were gathering people to them at an enormous rate needed to be stopped and he was going to stop them. He was part of the crowd that was there when Stephen was stoned to death for believing in Jesus. He went to the high priest and he got letters of authority to go to Damascus to round up many of the believers who had fled there after Stephen's arrest, trying to nip this new sect in the bud, not letting it form and grow. And so with zeal and fervour and anger, Saul of Tarsus, the arch enemy of the believers in Jesus Christ set off for Damascus. And along that road, he was blinded and spoken to by Jesus. The brightness of his presence took away his sight for a time, but the soul who arrived in Damascus was different from the soul who left Jerusalem. He studied the scriptures afresh. Barnabas helped him in that his eyes, his physical eyes were opened and his spiritual eyes were opened and he soon discovered that Jesus, the one who met him on that road, was indeed Messiah. And then, with a change of name to Paul, he became one of the leading evangelists and missionaries of the early church. So much so that many of the books of the New Testament are books that he wrote, such as this one, to Corinth, to a church that he had established. You might have been at one time, a bitter opponent of Christianity. You might have thought it was stupid and wrong. You might have disbelieved in everything. You might have had thoughts of agnosticism or atheism. You might have thought that this story of Jesus was a fairy story. But, but now maybe you're beginning to see things a little differently. Paul, the arch enemy of Jesus, became one of his most trusted allies, a fervent witness to Jesus' power to save, to love and to change his heart. This is the glorious story on this Easter Sunday. This is an amazing story, isn't it? There was the friend who was forgiven his denial. There was the brother who thought he was mad who was convinced at the end by the way Jesus faced death and by the words that he said and then by the opportunity to serve and to follow him. And then there was the one who was utterly convinced that Jesus was wrong, who then become, became utterly convinced that Jesus was right. Miracles of faith, a change of heart, a restoration, 
an acknowledgement that you'd been wrong and all, all three knew that Jesus had the capacity to forgive and to challenge and to change them and to encourage them and for them to grow. This is a wonderful message on this most peculiar and difficult of Easter days. Locked in our homes, when we would be out at church or maybe down the caravan, frightened and fearful of a virus that is sweeping across the world and will it come into our home? This is the backdrop that sets this Easter Sunday apart from all others that I have known. But the truth of the matter is that no matter if you have been a friend who has lost contact, a member of the family who has stopped believing, or an opponent who thought for a long time that Jesus was wrong, today you can know the power of his resurrection in your life. You can be restored you can be forgiven, you can be empowered, and you can live for this moment on as Paul did when he said, for me to live is Christ. May we live for Jesus this day. May we join that crowd of witnesses to Jesus, the one who is resurrected, the one who is our Saviour, our Lord and our friend. Before we draw this service to a close, may I say thank you to all who have taken part in this service for recording all their different segments and sending them to Matthew. Thank you to Matthew for putting them all together for this morning. And then just to say, if you've got any prayer requests, please send them to me. There's a band of people who are just willing and wanting to be able to pray into those situations. On this Easter Sunday, let us remember that we worship a risen Saviour and Lord. And our confidence and our hope is in him. And now may grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.